G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Uh, today, um, we've got a really exciting guest, uh, Simon from Your Maintenance Coach. Um, I'll get him to kind of explain what a maintenance coach is and, and what his, how he would fit in. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about the food industry, firstly in general, but then we're also gonna talk about uh, food grade lubricants and how they're used, how they're registered and all that kind of stuff. Um, Simon has a bit of a specialty in the food industry, works with a, a lot of clients in the food industry, especially in Australia. And so he's got a lot of uh, insights into maintenance and reliability practices within the food industry. Uh, so Simon, if you'd like to introduce yourself and kind of what you do. Sure, thanks Rafe. So yes, Simon Murray from Your Maintenance Coach. Um, and look, my background's always been maintenance, engineering in, in manufacturing and set up Your Maintenance Coach back in 2012 now. So just coming up to, to 10 years with the purpose of, I'd worked with a few companies, really taking them out of reactive into proactive maintenance. And I found that, I, look, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so I founded the business to go and help other businesses, other maintenance managers go through that journey. Now, obviously, when you've been through any journey time after time, there's, you know, you know, you learn a few shortcuts, you learn the, the quickest way to do it. And what I do now is I, I engage with, with businesses, particularly maintenance managers who want to really ramp up their reliability practices and, and you know, almost like that, that Sherpa carrying your bags, help them along the way and, uh, and coach them through that process. Cool, cool. So uh, maybe just something to pick up on there, because I know there's all sorts of different names for different types of maintenance. You talked about the difference between reactive and proactive, and then there's you know reactive, proactive, predictive. <laughs> so um, is do you do you see it very much as being a, a a kind of a journey? So that you know once people have gone from reactive to proactive, is there anything you know beyond that that you try to go to? Oh, look, I think there's there's always, you know, this chase in this, this best practice. What does best practice look like? And, you know, yeah. when you look at the businesses that consider themselves best practice, they're the ones that are still trying to, you know, to achieve more. And I always I always come back and use the example. I was fortunate enough to visit the, the Toyota factory down here in, in Melbourne just before it closed down. Mm -hmm. We probably two weeks before it shut down. And we're walking around and it, it was like there was it was like there was a crisis meeting going on. And when we asked what it was, this crisis meeting was because the day before they'd achieved 96% uptime on a line. And as I say, even two weeks before the factory was closing, that was just chaos. It's like, we must drive for more. So that's, you know, that's kind of the epitome of where I think businesses can get to. Um, but I think largely, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people I work with, it's very much in those early stages. It's how do we, how do we even shape, how do we embed that mindset so that we can start on that journey? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're starting from reactive, where phone calls in the middle of the night, it's all breakdowns. Then we progress to this little bit of, you know, a bit of a sense of calm where we're, you know, we're still getting breakdowns, but we, we've got a good handle on our systems and some processes and structures are in place. And then, as you say, we get to that full proactive stage where, you know, and even going back five, six years ago, that proactive stage was still, still very, um, still very human. Now we're looking at Internet of Things and it being mm. completely automated. So there's there's always new ways to continue on that improvement journey. Yeah. Okay. That's that that Toyota example is is kind of fascinating, right? Because that's that's a whole um, behavioral kind of mindset and culture yeah. around maintenance and reliability right to be able to to still pursue that level of excellence when you're two weeks from closing that's uh that's it and even you know as i say even at 96 percent uptime even even then chasing those last couple of percent when you you know it's it, and it's the law of diminishing returns mm -hmm. but it was as you say it's just baked into that culture that we we strive to work out how we can how we can do better each day yeah right wow um all right, so let's start with the food industry um, mm. and, and maybe a, a little bit of a general opener on the state of the food industry. So like many industries, I'm sure it went through a lot of disruptions as a result of COVID. Um, so most industries have gone through different changes in supply and demand. I guess one thing with the food industry is that generally everyone has been eating 
the same amount, right? It's not like people eat less or more on a given day, unlike, let's say, for example, the transportation industry or airlines or something like that. But have, there, have you seen any changes in the way that the food industry has had to operate? Yeah, look, very, very much so. So there's, you know, I think most people, most manufacturers were hit with this sort of, you know, the panic buying, the big mm. surge where, where instantly there was this just massive ramp up of let's just make whatever we can and get it out the door because we know we can sell it. So that, that was seen very much in the early stages where it was just how do we, how do we get this stuff out? Um, then then what, what I've seen happen probably, you know, probably as things started to settle a little is a real change in what, what is being supplied. And this, this one came as quite a, su- a surprise to me because you know, if you think of a, you know, a, a crisp manufacturer, you know, a chip manufacturer, for example, lots of the product is actually smaller bags that might go away to the office or go to school kids. Mm. None of that exists anymore. So what they're actually seeing is this big change from, you know, like even a multi-pack product or a small serve or single serve type products that would go in someone's school bag or briefcase to now everything is the, you know, the big family size packs or big tubs of something. Um, so it's been a real shift in that. And obviously some of these, some of these sites are actually geared up to produce the right balance. So they've seen, you know, in some cases they've got wine sat idle and other lines sat double the capacity. So it's created a real interest in dynamics in a lot of people trying to trying to adapt to that to balance their production needs across equipment. Um, so a real shift in that. And I suppose the, 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 the third thing I'm starting to see is, is the supply chain issues with things coming from overseas. Yeah. And a lot of that, you know, some of that is, is packaging equipment, for example. So lots of people now trying to, trying to source their packaging materials in Australia rather than having them, having them imported. Um, and lots of, you know, businesses even looking to, you know, where they were buying in finished goods from overseas, now looking to see how can we make them, make them here. So lots of changes yeah, right. um, and, and challenges, you know, the biggest, I would say the biggest challenge I, I see is pre-COVID, most of my time was spent on site, you know, mm. tinkering and training and, and actually being out there looking and feeling what's going on. I would say by far most, the, the biggest challenge I'm seeing people face is just the having to deal with the complexity of what's going on. Um, so there's lots of, you know, lots of projects I'm working on where, where people are saying to me, look, we know it's a good idea. We want to do it. We need to do it. But I've just got too much going on at the moment, just trying to get through the day with all this other complexity of, you know, who's going to turn up on shift? What machines have we got to run? So it's really, it's impacted, I think, a lot in, you know, I'd say just that extra, extra thought and the extra, extra thinking and the extra projects people are having to do. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. A couple of things to pick up on there as well. Um, one of them, I think, was you discussing uh, the flexibility in people's manufacturing lines. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of give the example that I was working with a toilet paper manufacturer, right? And um, you know, people go to the toilet the same amount, you know, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. The pandemic doesn't affect no. how much you go to the toilet. <laughs> Uh, but of course, we had those, uh, excuse the pun, r- run on, on toilet paper, mm-hmm. um, you know, where people were going out and panic buying. Uh, and the toilet paper manufacturers are not set up for any kind of flexibility in their manufacturing process because they're used to churning out the same amount of paper, uh, you know, day in, day out. And um, there was also a bit of a change in the types of toilet paper. So, yeah, if you really dig into it, toilet paper for the hospitality industry is is quite different to what is sold in in the home, and like you were saying, you know, less fewer sales into the schools and offices and hotels and things, and more into people's households. They were just they were just blown away by by the sudden changes over the course of a couple of months. Um, so it's interesting to to know as well that in food manufacturing you might have different manufacturing lines for the same product that's getting just packed differently mm-hmm. um that's it yeah that's uh that, that's really interesting yeah um, and there's also as you say things like hospitality you know, i've got quite a few clients who do um food service industry for example and mm-hmm. that's just that's just vanished so they're and some of them 
been really interested. The ones I've seen really adapt are, okay, we're not doing food service in a big box now. Let's let's put things in bags and, and adapt through to Woolies and Coles and, you know, through the supermarkets because, again, to some advantage, the because of that ramp up, the existing suppliers haven't been able to meet full demand. Yeah. So in, in many cases, it's balanced itself out across the uh, across the sector. Oh, yeah, interesting. Hmm. So maybe we could ask uh, you about some of the unique challenges that face the food industry when it comes to maintenance and reliability. So I know you work across all industries, <laughs> but you've got quite a few clients in, in the food industry specifically. Um, so there are some maintenance and reliability challenges that are, I would say, unique. Well, they're common to everyone. But mm-hmm. what's kind of unique about the food industry? Yeah, okay. So the, the the biggest thing that I see come through, and I've had this, it's funny, I've had this discussion probably three or four times this week, and it's it's not, you know, it's it really brings itself out in the food industry. And it's because it's driven, particularly those people who are producing stuff that doesn't sit in a, in a warehouse for, you know, six, seven months. Mm. So lots of my clients are, are daily fresh. So bakeries, dairy, for example they're really driven by what the supermarkets demand. Um, Mm. So where if we look at, let's take the other extreme of something like an airline or a mine or a a gas plant, which really asset intensive industries, when the maintenance is due on a piece of equipment, the business understands we're gonna shut down and we're gonna do that maintenance. You know, an airline doesn't say, well, look, We've got this maintenance due, but maybe we'll run the airline. Maybe we'll run the plane for an extra couple of months. That yeah. just doesn't happen in that industry. When you flip to the food industry, um, and, and I think any you know any any sort of lower low low intensity manufacturing, but particularly the food industry, do we supply all of our product to the supermarket tomorrow, or do we stop for twelve hours and do maintenance? Well, guess what? The decision is to supply the supermarket every single day. And what that means is the maintenance team has to be very, very dynamic in how they deal with that. You know, it's not a 10,000 hour service, we're gonna stop and do it. You've got to work out how do you break that 10,000 hour service down into small one hour chunks and fit it in. Maybe it's on a Wednesday night shift where while we're cleaning the machine, maybe it's the weekend. So you've got to be really dynamic because that pressure is on about supply. And the, the example I often use, I spent a lot of time with um, it baking bread in the, uh, in the baking industry. And over the years, you know, the, 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 the big players used to have small bakeries in all the different regional towns. And over the years, that's been consolidated into almost super plants in the capital cities. But what that means is your average delivery driver, you know, one, one, one factory, for example, big bakery in Sydney, and we're delivering out to Dubbo, which is a five hour drive away. Now for the truck driver to get there and back within his sort of legal legal hours, he's got no window of, um, you know, the truck has to leave on time. So from a manufacturing perspective and a maintenance perspective, you've got about a 15 minute window to get that truck loaded. So if you have a 30 minute breakdown, that city, that town doesn't get any bread for the day. So these are the complexities where you've got, you know, how do we how do we keep our PMs up to scratch? How do we do our preventative and our inspections while at the same time we've just got to keep everything running? Mm. So, okay, that's an insight that I <laughs> consider actually was how the effects of consolidation on on supply chain. That's interesting. Um, mm. Right. So how is how is some of this maybe driven also by the economics of the industry? So, you know, for the international viewers in Australia, there was a lot of news and a lot of headlines probably about, what, five years ago about the way that dairy farmers were being mm-hmm. so squeezed on margins by the big supermarket chains. So yep. we mm-hmm. effectively only have two supermarket options here, right? You've got, you've got Coles and Woolworths and they kind of dominate the industry. I know Aldi's sort of making a bit of a play. But what we were finding was that they have so much uh, market power that they were able to, to squeeze out a lot of these independent farmers. So is that, this, is that the case across the entire food industry or do they maybe have a few more options? Um, look, I think it's, it's certainly a challenge there. You know, I, I see a lot of, um, and this, this again is 
because our, our sort of domestic market in Australia is, is relatively tiny to the rest mm. of the world. Um, you know, we're what, 20, 20, 25 million people. So it's in some countries, it's a, we're a major, major city or a, a small town in some countries. Um, those, what, what I'm certainly seeing is there are probably, there's actually very few manufacturers left over here who only make their own brands. You know, most uh -huh. most businesses have had to adapt to, you know, the supermarkets. If you look at their sales, and I, I forget the numbers, but maybe 40, maybe even 50% of their sales is what they call their home branded products. Mm -hmm. So it's not the big name brands. So that's that's one thing that's changed is most of most of the manufacturers who have adapted, they're actually got their own brand names, but they're also making other brands under license. The, the second point I'd make on that is even some of the major manufacturer or what we consider manufacturers or big global brands, even some of those don't manufacture themselves anymore. Um, so there is, there is lots and lots and, and certainly many of my clients are third party manufacturers that would manufacture, yes, we're manufacturing directly for the supermarkets under their brand, but hey, we also manufacture for this big global well-known brand name because they don't have manufacturing set up in Australia anymore. And a lot of that has been driven through those, through those pricing, you know, those pricing forces that you described in that yeah. there's, you know, and I won't, won't name them here, but certainly there's a lot of global brands that have shut down their factories because they know, hang on, we're really good at branding and marketing. We're not that good at the manufacturing piece. However, this, this family business over here that's grown over the years, they're really good at that piece. So let's, let's, let's partner up with them and give them that work. So okay. lots of it's driven, as you say, it really is driven by those supermarkets. It's just such a, it's just such a, a big chunk of the market for everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess to draw an, uh, an analogy to the to lubricants world, because that kind of private label business is, is very common in lubricants manufacturing, right? Like, mm -hmm. So, you know, you, know, you, you buy a, a, a grease tube or, a, you know, a, a pail of lubricant and uh, it, it's got whatever brand on it. Yep. That's not necessarily who manufactured it, right? And there's a, mm -hmm. there's a whole industry of lubricant and grease manufacturers that make private label products. In fact, uh, the one that was kind of in the news recently, if you saw the, the fire at the grease plant over in the US, uh, where yep. there was a whole grease plant that burnt to the ground and um, no one really recognized the name. They were called Chemtool, uh, which was owned by the Lubrizol Co Corporation, who is a kind of an additive manufacturer, um, mm -hmm. who are actually owned by Berkshire Hathaway. So so eventually <laughs> Warren Buffett <laughs> kind of owned yeah. owned this uh, this plant. So he can, he can afford the loss. But uh, they, you know, no one recognized the brand because they predominantly make, you know, private label um, mm -hmm. stuff, even for uh, some of the like, vehicle OEMs or, or farm equipment o OEMs, they were making their yep. kind of branded greases and lubricants. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. that that's maybe a trend that we're seeing across a, a whole range of industries. That's it. And I, and I know, um, and again, very Australia specific, you've got your, you know, Aldi is the, you know, the super global supermarket chain now that's making big headway here, but obviously the there are manufacturers who I would say 80, 90% of their product just goes into Aldi. Um, so yeah. it's kind of the Aldi brand. Um, and one thing I've, I've seen in the past there is they I went through a project this many, many years ago now, but they were actually working with local suppliers to see, okay, how can we help you invest in equipment so that we don't have to bring all this stuff in from different countries around the world and we can, we can manufacture it locally to improve the supply chain process. So there's, there's, there's lots of stuff going on there as well. You know, we, we do give those, those big, big supermarkets a, a bad name in many cases, but in some cases they actually, they do a lot to support, to support local manufacturing as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so if we, if we pivot a little bit from maybe general maintenance and reliability mm. specifically to lubricants in the food industry, um, yeah. what are maybe some of the specific concerns in the, in the lubes, or in lubrication that people have to look out for in, in the food industry? Yeah, okay, so where, where do we start? Because it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's on the one side knowing what we should be doing and then it's the, and I'm sure you see it's the other side, it's looking at what people are actually doing. So um, a lot of, um, 
So a lot of what a lot of what I'm seeing, you know, let's go back go back ten years. Mm -hmm. I would say that was probably just when people were starting to think, okay, we need to start be thinking about food grade lubrication here. Yep. Um, you know, certainly go back to people I was working with ten years ago, just as I was starting the business. It was a you know, I'd walk into a plant and it's like, well, okay, we use food grade where we absolutely have to. Um, you know, and the concerns there were, and I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on this now, Rafe, is it's more expensive and it's not as good. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the initial thing and, and it was very much, a, we don't we don't want to use it. We, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can and we're only going to use it where we need to use it. So, so yeah, is that, and, and that was that was probably 10 years ago. Over that time period now, what we've started to see happen is as our external audits have been, you know, been coming up more and more, and particularly in the food industry, one of the one of the real things, one of the real, um, I suppose, important points around lubrication is that even though the site itself might not be lubrication experts, we've got the, you know, the customers, the amount of audits and assessments from a quality perspective that, that happen now, uh, some driven by the supermarkets, some driven by sort of external bodies, it's really, that's really dragged lubrication practices into the, you know, into the modern day. Right. So, you know, so a manufacturer, as we discussed, the third party manufacturer, they're not going to get away with not using food grade lubrication anymore. So it's almost become a, it must happen. The challenge with that I see is that it's become a, we must use food grade lubricant, but without the real understanding of making that transition or are we using the right stuff or how to use it. So it's really that case of, okay, as a, as a maintenance manager in a, in a food, in a, a food manufacturing facility, I must use food grade lubrication. That's it. But that's almost where the, you know, that's almost where they stop. So the, the challenge, you know, it almost, because there's just too much else going on. Yeah. So that, that almost becomes, I'll use food grade lubricant, tick the box. So. Mm, okay, that, that, that's interesting. Cause, so maybe to go back to your, your sort of first point, which was on, uh, let's say the perceived lack of performance mm. that you get out mm -hmm. of food grade lubricant. So this is actually a concern that is, is common, well, that I've seen anyway, is common to both food grade lubricants as well as uh, what we might bucket as the environmentally aware lubricants or EALs. Mm. So there's a whole class of those as well and there, there are sort of um, perceptions of poor performance in that area as well. Yep. So they're the ones that are you know readily biodegradable and low, low toxicity and all that kind of stuff. So in some ways, very similar to, to the food industry. Um, and I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the let's say poor reputation comes out because there's kind of two classes. There's two ways that you can do uh, biodegradable or food grade lubricants. So one is, so as, as a start, mineral oils in general are not going to do well as either biodegradable or food-based lubricants because um, being that they're manufactured from crude oil, you tend to have some uh, toxic components to it. Um, which is usually the aromatics that they're trying to pull out during the, the refining process. So that drives you to two ends of the spectrum. You either go full synthetic for your lubricants or you go vegetable oil based. And so one of those is kind of the lower end of the performance spectrum where you go vegetable oils. And one of them is the higher end of the spectrum, which you, you go full synthetic. And of course, there's a huge cost difference then between the two. Mm. So often, I think, when people see the disparity in cost, there's the, uh, especially if you're running pretty razor thin margins, a lot of maintenance organizations go, there is no way we're p paying for a full synthetic uh, mm -hmm. food lubricant solution. Let's go with the vegetable oil based one, which is so much cheaper. But then the performance that you get out of it is so much worse. Yeah. And so that reinforces the perception that the food grade or the biodegradable is, is significantly worse when it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, uh, so I think that there is that definitely that performance perception. Um, yeah, and I, I think you, you, you've hit the nail on the head then. I think now, now that we've moved to people saying, okay, we know we need food grade. Mm -hmm. um, and, and fortunately, most people have moved away from this. Let's just use it where we need to. And we've actually, you know, realized we can use, we can now use food grade 
in non-food grade places to consolidate the amount of uh, products we've got on the shelf. But even now then I see what we've almost created is, okay, we're using food grade uh, product. It's still that purchasing on price decision, even within that narrow band. So I think we've almost the driver is, as I say, it's food grade tea. We're not really peeling back the layers and looking at the performance levels of the products we're buying in every case. Now, some some of the more advanced, the more mature maintenance organizations certainly are. Yep. Um, but lots of the others, it's very much a case of, you know, it's food grade, I've ticked that box, I'll just pump it into the into the bearing and away we go. Um, yeah. And a lot of that's, that's not necessarily product related, that's about the education, the training and the, and the coaching piece. Yeah, and I guess maybe just one thing to pick up on as well, which is really important is, okay, now that you've put food grade lubricants into the application, your responsibility doesn't end there. No. Uh, I think there is <laughs> one of the other misnomers maybe in the industry is oh it's food grade therefore uh basically i can eat it or i can dr i can drink it <laughs> it's definitely not the case right so no. so if no. it's you know like a brief brief sidebar into the classification system so if it's nsf h1 certified that allows you you know you're trying to avoid contamination of the final product wherever possible but if contamination does occur you're allowed what is it 10 milligrams per kilo of food product so even then the allowable levels are vanishingly small right so this is this is very mm -hmm. very very incidental uh contact with the final product so it yeah once you've put food grade lubes into a into a bearing or a hydraulic system or, or whatever it is um you then still have a responsibility to prevent it <laughs> getting into the food product yeah <laughs> That's it. Yeah, certainly, certainly not not to be considered as an ingredient. Um, yeah, and I think that's a, <clears throat> excuse me. It is it is a big risk that people you know there, there is that level of comfort almost. Um, you know that sort of illusion that it is it is safe when it's it's not as you say it's not safe. It's just the it's that that tolerance is still there. Yeah. Um, and and I don't think that's widely widely appreciated as um, as much as it should be. Mm. So maybe. If we could talk, not not that we're trying to use a, you know, the carrot and the stick or anything like that, but what what are the kind of uh, ramifications for getting it wrong, in in the sense that you you talked about there's a lot of plant audits that are let's say conducted by whoever the end user is, right? So you talked mm -hmm. about third party manufacturers making on behalf a product on behalf of a let's say a brand, and that yeah. brand is therefore going to do audits of the manufacturing mm -hmm. facility. Um, do they do, let's say, you know, random sample testing of the final product to ensure that there's no, you know, nasties for want of a better word in it? How do they how do they ensure the sort of the quality of the final product in, in most? Yeah, look, they they really the different audits are supposed they vary. Okay. Um, so there are some which are literally auditing your internal processes mm -hmm. to make sure you have a process. And this is you know very similar to um, 9001, I think it is. Yep. It's you know, your, your basic quality system. Yet yeah, you've got a system, I can kind of see it works, but that, that level of audit doesn't necessarily validate if what you've got in that system is the right thing. Okay. Um, the next level of audit I've seen is where, um, and this was a one popular over here is the BRC audit, British Retail Consortium. And and it depends on the auditor sometimes too. So I've had an auditor there where they said, okay, let's go through your, your maintenance processes, show everything's in line. And some auditors, depending on their background, will actually delve into, okay, I can see you've got a preventative maintenance system. Let's actually have a look at if you're doing the right maintenance on that machine. Do I actually think you're doing the right stuff? And that's where you're kind of thinking, well, hang on a minute, I've, you know, that's, a, that's almost a whole different, um, yeah. different scenario. Um, so some auditors will push through that. Um, there is a, um, what's the other one? I think it's the American, there's an American Bakery Association they do random audits. So they, depending on who you're supplying to, and I've got a couple of clients over here in Australia who, who have um, their set up this way, they can just knock on your door and say, it's audit time. Wow. Um, 
no preparation time. Let's see what you're doing today. So they can be, um, and of course, when an audit comes to town, it's, it's chaos on site. And they, so they're the different kind of levels. And within that, some will do products. You know, everyone, each of the customers are doing product. Most manufacturers, in fact, are doing taste tests each day. Um, lots of things going off for, you know, micro analysis, um, shelf life testing, to, to the extent of whether or not they're testing for actual contamination of things like grease and, and oils. So I've not come across that yet. Yeah. Um, so, but certainly lots of, you know, lots of visual testing, you know, lots of most, most places, you know, metal detectors and x-rays are obviously commonplace, yeah. lots of taste tests, lots of, lots of mold and microbiological testing. Yeah. So yeah, they do, they do a lot. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting. So, I mean, I'd, I've done a bit of work with the, the fisheries industry and there've been a couple of questions come up in the past about, um, you know, they've, they found let's say hydrocarbons in a product sample mm -hmm. uh, and they're going through and doing an audit of where it could have come from. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, it could have been lubricants, but we were able to show them that it wasn't. Um, but because it's in the fisheries industry and you're on a fishing vessel, I mean, there's all kind, you know, it, it mm. could be <laughs> diesel from the engine room or whatever. Um, uh, so yeah, I was just curious uh, as to kind of how that happens. Yeah. yeah that, and the so I was just going to say, you know, most most of the plants now, unless you're working on kind of older equipment, um, most have been through some sort of risk assessment where, you know, gearboxes are now below the food stream. So when anything, you know, any factory or piece of equipment that's been built in the last 10 years, the risk of contamination is very, very low. Um, usually it's around, you know, if you've got some sort of mixing or filling area where the product is in direct contact with with something, that's normally where it's going to occur. Um, and then the risk of contamination through the rest of a production line where you've got open product on conveyors and things like that, um, that's that's really been minimized now over the years. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one question that I, I do like to ask people, and because this is sort of what this uh, <laughs> channel is, is all about, is trying to raise the profile of lubrication and lubrication technologies, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. it's something that in my experience, you go around to almost any industry and they don't sort of, uh, they don't view it as being particularly high in importance. Mm -hmm. So in the food industry, um, how do you perceive, first of all, where they see lubricants, right? You've mm -hmm. talked a little bit about it already, but also how do you think we, we as an industry can help to drive, um, I guess, people's understanding of where it should fit? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the, um, it is it is that journey. So overall, it, I would say, you know, we're, the value and the importance of lubrication is, is it's not well understood. Okay. Um, you know, it's, to me, it is, it's where I always, I start, you know, it's if I, if I go into a plant or I'm working with a business, show me your lubrication survey. Um, oh, we haven't got one. Okay. Well, it, that means two, you know, the, the importance of that survey to me, it ticks a couple of boxes. One is, one is around the lubrication piece, but more importantly for me, a really good lubrication routing means I've got somebody looking at every piece of equipment every day. Mm. And that's, that's eyes and ears on the ground. You know, when, when someone tells me we don't have a lubrication routing or our lubrication routing is it's buried in our PM system and, you know, different fitters get different pieces of it every week, that tells me you're not getting that consistent eyes and ears on the ground. Mm -hmm. So the teams, you know, go and work with someone, got plenty of clients, they say, okay, we've got one person dedicated to lubrication. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a step forward. Um, so you've got the same person doing the same routing every day or every week. He's understanding, he can see the changes in equipment. But the biggest challenge I see with at the moment is that we undervalue that person. We look, mm. let's get someone minimum wage. He's only pumping grease into the bearing. Can't be that hard. So we underinvest in that role when it's probably one of the most important roles in the business, you yeah. know, being able to. So that's the, that's the first challenge, you know, and the, the businesses that get this right, 
they pick you a good lubrication technician who's diligent. He can see the differences, and then they invest in some of the some of the training around that. So that's from the the human side. From the I suppose the product and the technical side, same thing. And we've touched on this. It's oh, if it's food grade, it must be okay. It's just grease, yeah. and that's that in in some not all businesses. Um, that's that education piece around what goes into the product. How can it actually help you know improve reliability? And and as I said, most most of my works with these businesses who are pushing out of reactive into proactive. Um, so nearly always when I start with a business, the, the lubrication system is immature and we got to take them on that journey. Um, and we, you know, we do that by starting to track, okay, for every breakdown we have, is it, could it have been prevented by better lubrication? And as we start tracking that, you really start to see, to see a picture, you know, you'll speak to people, oh, the bearing collapsed. Well, bearings don't just collapse, you know, they, <laughs> Uh, I can't remember who it is who says it's you know bearings don't fail they're murdered. Yeah. Um, I, I love that one. So, but it's no, no, no. It just happened randomly. No, it, it didn't just happen randomly. Mm -hmm. So that's the education piece around the product that we're putting in, and that's as I say, that's starting to improve. For um, yeah, as you say, and, and look from from an industry perspective, why why are we in that position, or why are manufacturers in that position and, and not sort of moving to the advanced stages? And I think it's because we have, particularly here in Australia, I would say 90% of lubrication people, businesses, people you can go to for help, also sell oil. Yeah. And it's actually very difficult to get, to phone someone up and get some trusted advice knowing you're not gonna be sold to. And of course, you know, as, as, as maintenance managers, we, we go through our careers, we build relationships with different suppliers and vendors. And I've, I've got suppliers and trusted people I've worked with for the last 20 years, and I, I, I know I just won't go anywhere else. Mm. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to, to start those relationships if you know, look, I just, I just need to know this technical aspect. I don't want to buy your stuff. I don't want to change my oil supplier. Um, I just need this technical knowledge. Um, yeah. And here... The market we've got at the moment, those two things often come really related. So, yeah, maintenance managers are often fearful to reach out for the for the fear of being sold to. Yeah, mm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, there, there is there's not much uh, like you say, kind of independent no. advice that mm. you can that, that you can reach out to. Yeah, and I, I guess um, one thing that I, I should it would be remiss of me not to mention as well on the on the product side. Um, uh, just because something says that it's food grade doesn't necessarily mean that it's food grade. Um, so for anyone who's listening to this, uh, who is involved in the lubrication industry, the, the w one thing, uh, you need to look for the NSF H1 certified. That's kind of like the, the standard um, for food grade lubricants and greases. Uh, so if you go onto the NSF website, they have a full listing of all the approved products. And so if you see something that says, you know, safe for use in food or something like that, it, it's worth going to check it. Um, uh, not, not trying to give the industry a bad name or anything like that, but there is, um, I have seen instances where manufacturers are claiming food safe without having gone through the registration process. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. just something that I, I, I thought I should get out there. I, at some stage, I'll do a video specifically on the registration process and, and what makes a, a food grade lubricant and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. you know, to go into the more technical aspects, but. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Also seen as well now, Rafe, is lots of um, certain businesses with um, halal certification. And, yeah. you know, and there's, there's lots of other certifications that are coming along now in addition to the, mm -hmm. to the food grade. Um, I had a client many years ago and they were a completely nut free site um, mm. So no nuts, no gluten. Um, there was a few other things that they and their, for their audit purposes, they had to demonstrate that all their lubrication met those needs as well. So mm. trying trying to get a certificate of a nut-free manufacturing environment from your lubrication supplier is is quite a challenge because obviously they've never. Well, of course, there's no nuts here, but how do we demonstrate that to you? How do we go through that audit process? So. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So to maybe to pick up a little bit on that. So first of all, um, yeah, halal and kosher certifications have become, 
you know, a little bit more common, certainly in Australia, mm. um, obviously in other parts of the world, it's standard practice. Yeah. Um, uh, and so people might be asking the question, well, what kind of ingredient in, in, in grease or lubricant could be non-halal? Um, and the reason is because there are some uh, additives which are derived from animal fats. And that's generally where you get the non-kosher, non-halal um, elements that might come into a food grade lubricant or grease. Um, so that's, that's how you would not pass a halal mm -hmm. or, or kosher test. Um, obviously, with some of the more kind of synthetic based ones, it's a little bit easier to, to pass those certifications. Um, but then when you talk about audits of where your product comes from, Right, so because you know the hal halal and kosher certifications have got to do with the manufacturing process for the lubricant or grease to ensure that it was manufactured in a halal or kosher environment, mm -hmm. and maybe just going back to the the quality side, there is actually a separate ISO standard that go sort of sits alongside NSF H one. It's called ISO two one four. Six nine, I think. I'd have to look up that number, um, but it is a manufacturing sp standard where uh, you know the lubricant manufacturer is audited to its manufacturing standards to ensure that the quality of the product, you know, is food grade and will be sort of consistently food grade. Um, so again, when you are looking to uh, procure your food grade lubricants. That might that certification might be something that you look for in your lube oil supplier. Um, so anyway, yep. this, that's just it's layers on layers on layers, right? <laughs> of of audits right. and certifications. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway, uh, hey Simon, I really appreciate you coming uh, to talk about this. I'm sure if people have questions or comments, please leave them below. I'm sure uh, Simon will be will be eager to see some of the questions that come through, and and I will mm -hmm. as well because often they're prompts for either you know further interviews or, or videos that I should be doing mm -hmm. and so yeah I really appreciate your your time and your insight because you've got a window into the the food industry that uh, I, I haven't really had all that much exposure to so really appreciate your time and thanks very much it's been a pleasure thanks Rafe <laughs>